So my name is Ben Names. I'm a senior aerospace analyst at uh, stress analyst at uh, SDA, and uh, today we're gonna. I'm just gonna give a brief overview and a bit of an introduction on conducting air elastic analysis using an ex-NASTRAN uh, with CMAP. Now, um, just as a as an overall kind of disclaimer to to put out there at the front. Um, Air elasticity and everything that it can encompass is a pretty broad field, as as um, specialized as it ends up being. So, I won't be able to get into too many specific details. You know, this isn't uh, an air elasticity class in general. Hopefully, this will give you a really good flavor as to some of the things that uh, Nastran is capable of running with CMAP. Um, and it'll give you a really good kind of idea as to when, when this type of analysis is useful um, and when you can, you know, really leverage it. Um, don't worry, by the way, my contact info is going to be at the very end, so if you want to get in contact with me about some question you might have had about the webinar, um, that'll be there as well. And this will be recorded, so if anyone is worried about missing a step or something like that, again, you could email me or you could just go ahead and watch the uh, recorded webinar. All right. Let's get started. So uh, today, for those of you who don't know, I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, who we are, SDA as a company, and what we do. Um, then I'm going to just give a, a little bit of a brief overview, at best, you could say, about air elasticity. I'll give an example, a kind of conceptual example of uh, an air elastic effect, just to give you guys an idea what some of that coupling can, uh, how it can manifest. And then I'm going to go over three examples. Uh, static air elasticity, just how to set up a simple static air elastic problem. Uh, then I'll talk briefly about air elastic tailoring and just uh, really give a, f uh, a good hint or a flavor as to what you can achieve uh, by using that or taking advantage of those kind of coupling effects uh, when you start talking about composites. Um, and then finally, I'm going to go over how to set up a, a simple flutter example. Oh, by the way, for those of all uh, who might be interested, this GIF right here is a picture of the, um, it's a body freedom flutter model that the Air Force Research Lab was uh, uh, made. So interesting behavior. Yes, you can actually model uh, body freedom flutter in NASTRAN. So I'm not going to talk about that today, but again, that's a, that's a good example of some of the capabilities. So uh, SDA is a structural analysis uh, aerospace company. Uh, we're based a little bit north of uh, Dulles Airport, about five miles north or so, and we specialize in aircraft, uh, the design analysis of uh, aircraft and spacecraft structures. Uh, we specialize in composites, and we have a whole range of different engineers from uh, holding uh, bachelor degrees up to uh, PhDs. This is just to give you a little bit of a an idea of some of the project we've worked on. Um, again, we handle everything from spacecraft, like the composite crew module and the Orion crew module, to aircraft, um, like the Arisand and Shadow that you can see there. We've handled a whole bunch of different other ones, but this just gives you all a good idea as to some of the typical projects that we work on here on a day-to-day -day basis. All right. Now, in terms, I you know I, I alluded this to uh, alluded to this at the beginning. I'm not going to be able to touch on everything. So, in terms of these air elastic solutions that Nastrin is capable of running. I'm only going to touch on two today, static air elastic response and aerodynamic flutter. Um, there is, again, the dynamic uh, air elastic response that you can uh, model as well as uh, you can do a sensitivity optimization uh, using air elastic models. In this case, not going to get into them today. Um, the other thing, too, that's worth mentioning is today I'm only going to be using the doublet lattice method um, for the static air elastic case, for those of you who don't know, this is going to boil down to a vortex lattice method. So anyone who's familiar with like X flyer or AVL, something like that, it's very simple kind of potential flow models that, that will end up being used. Um, it is subsonic compressible, um, but again, uh, Nastrain can handle uh, any range of uh, aerodynamic regimes as well. Um, just as a heads up, remember when we're talking about potential flow, uh, this does mean no drag. So it'll be really good uh, from a structural analysis standpoint and an air elasticity standpoint, um, unless 
you aren't too interested in the aerodynamic characteristics, this is not going to be able to replace you know, your aerodynamics team, for example. Um, but it'll give really accurate lifting loads for, for what you're, the behavior that you're interested in. Um, and if you want to find out a little bit more about how the double lattice works, double lattice method works, you can check out my thesis. Um, you can either go to my LinkedIn, there's a link right there. So, okay, um, air elasticity, what is it? Well, fundamentally, air elasticity is a coupling between several different forces. We get aerodynamic forces and and elastic forces. Um, now, this sounds really basic, so let's break it down and talk about some concrete, uh, more concrete examples. Um, for those of you who are familiar with uh, free vibration or normal modes analysis where you're looking for the natural frequencies in a structure, that's where you're looking at the interaction uh, or coupling, you might say, between the structural mechanics the, you know, the elastic behavior of a structure and the inertial forces, that, that mass within a structure, right? So you have your mass and stiffness matrix, that ends up what, what goes into that analysis. Um, the two types of other air elastic phenomena we'll be talking about today are static air, elasticity, <laughs> static air elasticity, which is the coupling of the elastic nature of the structure and our aerodynamic forces, um, and then we'll also be talking about flutter, which includes all three of those guys. So as a really simple example, let's just take some wing, let's say we were, we put a wing in a wind tunnel, an elastic wing, we give it, um, you know, there's some uh, angle of attack, and we end up generating lift about our cord to cord. Uh, but we know from kind of simple beam theory applications that really our structure is going to respond at the shear center, uh, not at the aerodynamic center, right? And so when we apply lift at that aerodynamic center, we actually get an additional torsion on the wing, right? Well, that torsion is going to produce some twist along the wing, which locally, depending on where you're at on the wing, will give you an additional angle of attack at that station, right? Okay, so we just produced a little bit more of an angle of attack. That means more lift, right? Uh, and again, that means more torsion. So we're twisting the wing again and we get an even higher angle of attack, which means higher lift, right? So you can see how these forces are kind of playing this runaway kind of game um, where you're getting this feedback. And hopefully, uh, you will converge to some kind of equilibrium solution. The case where you don't, where you just keep producing more and more and more lift is known as divergence, right? Um, so you do end up producing greater forces with your wing, but really what it's important to keep in mind is that the aerodynamics end up softening the structure and actually reducing the effective stiffness. All right, so let's get into a more concrete example. Uh, we're going to start with, uh, let's just say you're part of a team where you're analyzing a wing in a wind tunnel. Um, it's going to be fixed at the root down here. Okay, um, You can see it's a pretty high aspect ratio. There are all the parameters that you might want in order to model this, sans the structural information. We're going to assume the FEM is provided for us ahead of time, okay? And uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and jump on into that. So I have the model already up here. Um, let me go ahead and just show you all. So this is where we're constraining this model. This is like the, the wall of the wind tunnel. Um, and then the rest of it is, you know, again, just going to be immersed in the flow. Uh, all right, so the first thing that we need to do is actually just an artifact of how NASTRAN works. We need to make a property card, just an arrow uh, panel property card. It really doesn't matter any information on here since we're not doing a body. So I'm just going to put wing one, hit OK, and we're done. That's it. Um, again, this is really just an artifact of how NASTRAN works. Uh, now, first most important step is uh, we're going to make an arrow panel, okay? Um, so this is our aerodynamic model, the aerodynamic surface that we're going to be modeling. So I'm going to again just put wing one for the name to really matter. Um, let's go ahead. I'm going to turn filled edges on just so that we can get a good idea as to where the leading edge of the wing actually is. So let's zoom on in there. Whoop, let's try that again. Hang on. Sometimes with these large aspect ratio wings, uh, rotating can be a little dangerous. All right, so we're going to select a point at the leading edge, um, and we're also we're going to select a point at the leading edge of the tip of the wing, right? So that was the root. This is the tip now. So that's what that point one and four would typically correspond to. And now we want to provide the chord distance uh, from points one to two. So generally, this is one point one here. Again, this is two. 
this is three and this is four, right? Okay. Um, now, whenever you're classic analysis, I've found that it's really helpful to have it, uh, tables of these typical values. Again, we'll get into the flutter stuff later. For now, we're going to focus on the static or elastic parameters. So I'm going to go ahead and copy our core length, which I noted ahead of time. Notice there is no sweep in this case. Of course, you can't add sweep, taper, whole nine yards. So that's um, that's something absolutely you can do. Uh, generally, for a good starting point, I like to use about 10 um, boxes uh, for the in the cord length for our uh, arrow panel. You can use any any number that you want, um, and then um, but obviously you know higher is going to be more accurate. And then usually you want to try and keep the aspect ratio of your boxes to about an aspect on anything above three the accuracy starts to become rather suspect. So keep that in mind. Um, usually this shouldn't end up being too computationally intensive. Um, all right, don't worry about this error. This is just because we haven't set up uh, an error elastic analysis yet. They're asking for some coordinate system, but it's okay. We'll resolve that later. Um, in the meantime, we're done, actually. We've set up our aerodynamic model, right? So we have a beautiful structural model, nice and detailed. Let's actually turn off the ledges so we can see that a little bit nicer. So we have our structural model, we have our aerodynamic model. Now the only problem is we need some way to transfer information from the one model to the other, right? You saw that in our simple case with our uh, airfoil section, as we deformed, right, as our airfoil deflected and rotated really, we ended up generating more lift, right? So as our structure deformed, that information had to be passed to our aerodynamic model and then with that aerodynamic model, we generate new lift, and then we have to apply those forces back to the structure. So we need to use a spline to do that. That's all, that's all a spline really is. Um, you might hear it used, you know, referenced. That's really all a spline is. It's that bridge that transfers information from your aerodynamic model to your structure model and then back, okay? Uh, now, to set up the spline, you'll see we'll need information about the aerodynamic model here. Um, in this case, I'm going to just select all boxes on the aerodynamic model. Nothing too fancy about that. Um, and then in this case, I went ahead of time and I'll show these nodes in a second. Um, and I selected a series of nodes um, that I want to model on the structure. Okay. All right. So we're going to hit enter. Now you can see, so all these kind of teal points, these are all the nodes that I've selected along the structure in order to transfer how the if the structural model moves, how that end up, ends up translating to the aerodynamic model, all right? Okay. Now with that, we're all set for the model. The model's done. We don't have to touch that anymore. At this place, if we wanted to run a static air elastic, a dynamic flutter analysis, whatever you want, the model is done. So at this point, we just have to set up an analysis. So let's go ahead and do that. You can see I have a normal modes set up here from when I was doing stuff before, just testing it out. Um, all right, static air elasticity. Um, let's go ahead and do static air elasticity. Uh, I'm going to just put some information about our regime. So if you remember from the from the slides, we're going to do at a free stream uh, airspeed of 74 miles per hour. Um, and then the other important piece of information is going to be at one. Uh, let's see, angle of attack equals one. Okay, this is just note keeping. It doesn't mean anything. It's just a title, but I find it's useful just if we run it later, we'll know what's going on. All right, so we're going to skip a few of those preliminary things. Now, the first most important thing that I kind of, uh, I hadn't talked about this yet, is we have this aerodynamic coordinate system right here. Let me move this one box. So you see we have this aerodynamic coordinate system right here. This is really important, okay? Um, in order for the aerodynamics to be calculated correctly, when you set up your model, you need to make sure that it references this coordinate system such that x is always in the downstream direction, okay? Uh, y is out the direction of one of the wings. It really doesn't matter which direction, um, except for then you have to make sure that z uh, is um, in the opposite plunging motion, right? So that's that's the way that lift is going, right? Uh, lift is vertical, so that's, that's the direction we're going to be going. So we're going to set both our aerodynamic and reference coordinate system to that air elastic coordinate system there. Okay, um, and now again, these are some of those parameters that I said we would need to write in typically. So there's our cord length again. I still have that copied. Now, 
this is a little bit tricky, so stay with me. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them later. Okay, so don't get lost. Um, when we're referencing the span for our model, we need to actually use the full span of the aircraft in this case, right? Now we're only doing the uh, we're only looking at a wing, right? But if this were on an aircraft, it, the span would be from tip to tip. Okay, so in this case, we actually needed to put that value. So I'm using double the span here in this case, or double what we have geometrically if, if we were to measure it, right? So let's go ahead and put that in. And now what's tricky is the wing area is the core length times the span that we see in our physical model, okay? So that's actually times half of this value, okay? And again, I've pre-computed this right here. So we'll go ahead and put that in. Um, now finally, we did say this, this model, for example, is in a wind tunnel, right? Um, so we're going to make sure we want to consider symmetry about this XZ plane, all right? Okay. Uh, with that, we have one last step. We're going to enable trim on the air elastic trim parameters. Now, Mach number, uh, typically, whenever we see that when we're doing air elastic analysis, Mach number is just an indication of how important compressibility affects. 74 miles an hour is pretty slow, so we can actually neglect that and just say we have a Mach number of zero. Um, and then we're going to go ahead and input our dynamic pressure. You can see a little bit of the math that we that went into this. Um, now, as a note, if you'll notice, um, the density that I'm using for this is in flinch per inch cubed, okay, or pound foot second squared per inch to the fourth. This is because the baseline units for my model are in inches, uh, seconds, and pound or and and uh, flinches, okay. Depending on what kind of convention, uh, unit convention you're using, this can get tricky. So this is where you really need to pay attention on that density, um, what your units are in the model. All right. So let's go ahead and put that in there. Um, all right. And the last, last but not least, we're going to go ahead and put in some angle of attack. We're going to set that as a fixed parameter. And we're going to put in one angle of attack, but this has to be in radians, not degrees. Let's see, so 3.149 over 180. So that's one radian. Go ahead and add that. And then we have our typical kind of boundary conditions. In this case, we're just having a fixed constraint, and that's it. And we're done. So at this point, we've set up our air elastic analysis. We could run it, no problem. Um, I'm going to just go and go ahead and go over to the final results. Uh, if we look at this model, so same model, right? Um, this looks relatively like a reasonable kind of distribution. This looks like something we would expect. If we wanted to, we could go ahead and look at our max failure index. Um, nothing too revolutionary about that. Uh, one thing I want you to know, we're going to look at it from the front. Um, you can actually, in Nastrain, you have the option to run a rigid trim or a just normal air elastic analysis. A uh, rigid trim analysis means that we're not taking into account the flexibility of our aircraft, right? Um, now notice, if we consider the full air elastic analysis, if you pay close attention, the deflections are slightly different, okay? Now, depending on how flexible your structure is compared with the um, whatever your dynamic pressure is, this might not, you know, may or may not be a big deal. Uh, one thing that's really important, and if the, you know, just a few things you take away from this, this is one of those things. For whatever reason I've found, and I'm, this, this appears to be a bug that I'm working with people at uh, Siemens actually on, um, when writing your trim card, so hopefully some of these values we have our density here, we have our angle attack here, uh, CMAP auto writes this one value, and what happens is this parameter says that if it's one, run a full air elastic normal analysis, right? Consider the flexibility of the structure. If it's zero, pretend the structure is rigid and generate your aerodynamics that way. Now, I've found that no matter what this value is, uh, it tends to be running always, Nastrin will only run a rigid air elastic analysis. So whatever you do, if you're ever, for now, until this update uh, comes through the FEMAP people to remove this value, because it is just an optional parameter, Whenever you're running a static or elastic analysis, make sure to remove this value, okay? All right. Um, and then, so yeah, you would just go ahead, delete that, and then just analyze from there. All right. So that, that should give you a good flavor. Now, one of the things that's awesome about this, not once did I have to map any pressures, not once did I have to talk to an aerodynamics team, and yet I have 3D, uh, very, you know, relatively high fidelity aerodynamics for pretty low computation time, 
and it also considers the aerodynamics of the structure. Notice, if I even if I use CFD, I'm just going to be at best doing this rigid trim analysis, right? I'm just going to be applying those rigid aerodynamic loads. Um, again, for this structure, it didn't be t appear to be too big of a deal, but for our next example, you see those air elastic effects can really play a role in how the structure behaves and the overall lift actually is generated out of the structure. Um, if we want to go ahead and check our, our solution against some analytic results, if we go ahead and use strip theory, right, so we assume a lift curve slope of 2 pi, um, constant uh, constant loading over the wing, uh, we predict our wing to produce about 30 pounds of lift. Uh, and using NASTRAN, if we consider a rigid lift analysis, we get about 26 pounds. If we consider the actual air elastic, you know, elastic structure, uh, air elastic lift, we actually get about three quarters more of a pound. So again, in this case, it didn't, it wasn't significant, but you'll see an example next where it was very significant. So let's jump into the presentation again. All right, so let's talk about aeroelastic tailoring. Um, one of the biggest things that can come up if you have a flexible structure, or for example, there have been a couple of uh, more famous forward swept wings, uh, your lift distribution is not going to be, no matter how you design it, it's not going to end up being some nice elliptic lift distribution that your aerodynamics team you know, designed. What's going to end up happening is the additional twist and deflection of your structure will end up resulting in some some other lift distribution, right? Now, what does that mean? Well, in this case, for this picture here, we're putting more force out towards the tip, and it's going to lead to a higher bending moment at the root, right? So definitely bad for us structure guys. Um, you can definitely play with some of these values. Um, for example, you can uh, either mess with your uh, composite couplings, you know, your anisotropic couplings due to, to the fiber orientation, stuff like that, um, to tailor this lift curve slope so it behaves a little bit more like an elliptic lift curve that you want. Um, but another thing that's really important to consider is that uh, it can allow you to passively reduce the effects of, for example, a gust. Let's say you get some big gust over the wing. Um, you can tailor your wing so that at that higher dynamic pressure, um, you'll actually reduce the amount of lift that's generated, or maybe keep it more constant as opposed to increasing and really spiking, okay? Now today, again, we're going to mess with some bending torsion coupling, but you can mess with any kind of composite couplings for your wing. So the cross-section of our wing is going to look exactly the same. Um, we're going to have some skin here and here. Uh, we're going to have two vertical shear webs, but what's interesting is this top and bottom laminate are going to have their fiber orientations changed. Um, now, parametrically, they'll, so they'll change at the same time, the same values, um, but in manipulating them that way, uh, when we get this bending, we'll also introduce some twist, right? So now that twist could be positive, it could reduce the amount of lift that we get, or it could be negative, it could really increase and blow up, right, and reduce the stiffness of our structure. Uh, so without further ado, let's go ahead and jump on into that. Now, it's essentially the same model, so I'm not going to go over the setup. Uh, because all that procedure is very similar. I'm really just going to talk about some of the difference in results from a, uh, a conceptual perspective, at least at first. All right. So you can see, again, we're plotting our max failure index. You know, that's probably, that might be a characteristic you're looking at. Um, and in this case, our wing looks like it's deflecting normally. So this is if we consider only rigid, uh, only those rigid air loads, for example, at when we have a uh, fiber angle orientation of minus 20 degrees. Now, I just want everyone to pay very close attention, okay? Watch what happens when we consider the elastic behavior of the structure under these air loads. All right, so two things. Our deflection is crazy high now. We have max failure indexes way above one, and you can definitely tell that the structure, the stiffness of the structure is degrading very quickly, right? So in this case, that that minus theta orientation, that's going to decrease our, our stiffness, okay? If you notice, when we apply just minus 10 degrees, all of a sudden that, that stiffness is much closer to what we want. Uh, it is definitely generating more lift, and you'll see that in a second. This is for the flexible wing case. Now, if you notice, again, as we, as we go positive, we're actually getting less deflection. Um, now, this is a little bit special. There's a little bit more deflection for the theta 20 case, but that's actually because as we're, we're trading off between 
our torsional stiffness in some ways, and our bending stiffness as well. So that's why we see more deflection, although if we went in, you would be able to see there's actually less twist. Okay? So let's get a little bit to the proof of that. Let's talk about loading. All right? So I went in, I used the rigid body tools of FEMAF, and I was able to get the spanwise loading of the wing. Okay? So you can see here's, here's that rigid um, spanwise loading of our wing. If we consider the air elastic effects, um, we we jump up to this yellow curve, okay, and you'll see how that kind of how that propagates throughout an analysis. Um, and you can see that as we increase theta, right, as we go from minus 10 theta to to 20 theta, um, we're reducing the effective angle of attack along our span and reducing the amount of lift that we're actually generating. Okay. All right. Um, so here, this is again, this is just our shear force again, similar pattern as we increase that uh, that parametric angle of attack of our, or sorry, <laughs> the parametric angle of our fiber orientations, we're increasing on angle of attack. Oh, sorry, we're, we're increasing our shear our uh, shear force, and then again, same pattern as we increase uh, uh, as we increase theta. In this case, we're, we're actually decreasing our bending moment. And if you'll notice, just as a side note for when you think this might be important or not, there's actually an 8% difference in the bending root moment between the rigid and elastic uh, analysis. Okay, So if 8% is a big deal for a fairly rigid wing, um, this kind of gives you an idea as to how a small, tiny difference, for example, fairly small difference in our spanwise loading, but 8% in bending moment can be a huge difference in... Uh, in the structural integrity at the root. All right. Okay, so I breathe through that. Um, I'm going to talk about setting up a flutter analysis. Okay. Um, now, one of the things that's tough about flutter, it does. Uh, again, it takes into account those three sources instead of just two sources of forces. Right. Um, it's the inertial aerodynamic and the elastic forces. Um, so let's take flutter, we're going to boil it down and actually take it to where the airspeed is zero. So what does that mean? Okay. Well, if we take our flutter equation and we reduce it to an airspeed of zero, it's actually going to reduce back to our normal free vibration uh, analysis. Okay. So um, what this means is that when you're conducting a flutter analysis, your uh, zero airspeed frequency should be very close to your free vibration uh, frequencies. If they don't, that might be something you want to take a look at. That may be a units issue. Um, all right, I'm going to go ahead and turn off our spline for now just because it's the, the visuals it's a little distracting. And again, we don't have to mess with the model really at all. I'm just going to set up a flutter analysis. So let's do flutter. And all right, breathe through a couple of these. Uh, now, the first important thing to keep in mind when we get to the modal analysis, uh, flutter analyses are almost always imaginary, uh, use imaginary numbers. So you'll want to switch your solution, your modal solution, to a complex solution method. So we're going to switch it to complex launches. And for a simple wing, just a, you know, a, a single structure, uh, usually six modes is enough. You can do more, you can do less, um, but I find usually six modes encompasses um, at least the first um, the first or second free vibration modes from most of the possible degrees of freedom of our wing. All right. Um, now again, we're going to switch it to our air elastic coordinate system. Our velocity actually doesn't matter for a flutter analysis. It will matter for a, um, a dynamic air elastic analysis. Um, all right. So let's put in our reference length is, again, just our cord length here. So let's go ahead and enter that guy in. And we have our reference density. Again, this is in slinches per inches cubed. Um, the, for you, all you guys who use SI units, this will be a little bit easier to handle. Um, again, we have the symmetry. Now, when we generate our aerodynamics, we're going to do that for a combination of reduced frequencies and Mach numbers. Okay? So I have this copy data table right here in Excel. I'm going to paste that in the clipboard, and we're all set to go. That's all we need to do there. Notice the units. By the way, it's Mach uh, number versus, they say frequency, although, it, again, it's um, reduced frequency. Um, all right, we can continue on. We get to the flutter parameters, so we're going to enable flutter. Um, in my opinion, uh, typically the, the, the solution I, I prefer to go with most often is the PKNL method. Uh, it has all the robustness of the PK method and, and, and accuracy, um, but it's a little bit more efficient than the PK method. Um, 
All right, now for density ratios, this is if we want to, for example, consider uh, different altitude effects. I'm always going to just consider that we're at sea level, so we'll maintain that. Um, all right, our Mach number, again, we're probably going to consider this to be incompressible. Um, if we need to, we can always add compressibility um, and consider that in an iterative process, so that's, you know, on the user side, so that's not too difficult if, if your flutter speed ends up being high enough to consider that. Um, and now when we're using the PK method, we enter velocities, okay? And again, our units in this model are in inches, so we have to input our velocity in inches per second. If you'll notice, I'm sweeping from about 30 miles per hour, 30 miles per hour to about 255, okay? Let's go ahead and paste that in. Um, and again, we have our own boundary conditions and we're done, actually. Um, now, let's go ahead, I'm going to switch over to the finished model. Um, I could run it, but it'll just take a little bit of time. Again, what we should see, uh, let me scale these values down. So this is a normal modes result, okay? So we should see at low air speeds our, um, let's see, sorry. At low air speeds, this is what, these are what our modes should end up resulting as, okay? So you can see a second bending mode. Here's our first torsion mode, so that's probably going to be important, important, mode four. Keep an eye out for that in the future. Um, and we get two things out of this, okay? If we were to go into the FO6, um, we can get, not only can we get our actual air elastic mode shapes, I'll go over these in a second. Here's uh, one example of them. Let me try this again. All right. So here's one example of our, one of our mode shapes, okay? Um, and we can keep going over that. But we get, so the first thing we get is our frequency, okay? So this is important, again, at that zero airspeed, we should see the frequencies at very close, if not almost exactly the same as our free vibration uh, modes. Uh, but then if you notice, as we increase airspeed, stuff happens to the frequencies, okay? Most notable is mode one. You can see that we're going from some frequency eventually down to zero. This indicates that mode one is going from kind of a dynamic response if we give it a perturbation to a more quasi-static response as we give it a perturbation. And what this really means is likely this mode is going to diverge at some point. Um, so you'll want to look at the damping of this mode in the future. Now, remember how I said keep an eye on that fourth mode, torsion mode? Okay, well, we have mode four and mode three here. You notice they're growing closer together. This is really indicative of flutter. And what's actually happening is it's an indication that we can transfer energy between the fourth and the third mode, okay? So what does that end up looking like on the damping side? All right. Now, we always want negative damping. If we give a part perturbation and we have negative damping, it's going to reduce our amplitude to zero as we go out to time equals infinity, right? So we like it when our damping is less than zero. Here we have our zero mark. See, we can see mode four again. This mode four, it definitely goes unstable, roughly at about 230 miles an hour. Then we have also, this, this orange line might be going unstable, okay? So if we take a little bit of a closer look, we find that, yep, that mode, that mode 4 is definitely going unstable, but our mode 2 actually goes unstable a little bit sooner. And again, this, didn't, this is not the, that, that divergence mode. That was mode 1, right? So if you have some structural damping anywhere between 1 and 5%, this might not be a big deal, right? You might still see that first, fourth mode flutter first, um, but that's not always the case. Um, and now I'm getting towards the end. One last thing I want to show that's a really important thing, okay? Um, it's not uh, always self-explanatory how we get these, these output results. If you run a flutter analysis, really all you're going to get is an FO6 that looks roughly, um, let's see if I can pull this up quickly. So you're going to get some FO6. And it's going to look roughly, so you can see this is tabulated results where we get our velocity, we get our damping, and we get our frequency. Okay, so that's all you would get. In order to actually get your mode shapes into NAS train, what you have to do, all right, oh, and as a side note, let's take a look. So this was that fourth mode. Let's see, let's try this again. Um, hmm. For some reason, it's not showing the total translation. All right, I'm going to come back to that in just a second then. Um, so if we go into our flutter analysis, in order to get those, those eigenvectors really, or just the, those modes post-processed into NASTRAN, again, you're going to want to preview input, edit that preview, and then if you go down, this is the, the FL5 
is where we input our velocities. Just go ahead, let's say we want to figure out, we want to know what the, the mode shapes are there. Put a negative sign in front of that velocity. That'll ensure that you'll get the, uh, the mode shape, which shows the damping and the frequency at that airspeed. Okay. Um, all right. I'm not quite sure why that's not showing. If it were to show, all right, um, again, this is, this is actually that mode that I was showing you. So you can see not only are we getting some bending, but we're also getting some torsional behavior about the wing as well. All right. Um, so listen, that about wraps everything up. Hopefully, I've just given you all a good idea as to what, uh, what you can do with NASTRAN in terms of air elastic analysis. Um, I really, in some ways, only brushed the surface, so there's definitely a lot more that you can do. So if I didn't say something that, that, that you're interested in, check with us. It's likely that NASTRAN can do it, and I just didn't have time to talk about it. Uh, we are, again, na uh, resellers of all these Siemens products as well as Hypersizer. Um, if you're just learning FEMAP, all right, if you're new to FEMAP, uh, our very own Eric Gustafson actually wrote a book on how to learn FEMAP. This doesn't have anything with flutter in it or uh, air elastic analysis, but again, just if, if you're new to FEMAP and you're unfamiliar with it, this is a, this is a really good learning tool. Uh, and again, finally, my name is Ben Names. Um, if you have any questions about what I went over today, um, feel free to email me or get in contact with me somehow. And if you have any questions about sales, you can contact uh, Marty. Uh, and I think with that, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and take some questions. Let's see. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm having trouble looking at these. Jim, you may want to, is it possible for you to read off any of these questions if we get them in? Uh, yeah, well, I can see every question that's been asked, but none so far. Okay. All right. Hopefully you weren't over everybody's head, so they're not sure what to ask. <laughs> no, ho hopefully. Are you, you got one. What's the difference between MK Aero 1 and MK Aero 2 cards? Good question. Um, you can look that up. Let's see. I, I'll, I'll try and blaze through this. If we get any questions further, um, I might jump to one of those. You can look it up in the documentation, and let's see if I can just, I'm going to try and find these on the fly. Let's see how fast I can find it. Um, ah, okay, yeah, great question. Um, I think uh, the way CMAP writes these cards, it writes it as an MK Error 2 card. The only difference is how you actually present the information. Uh, when you do an MK Aero 1 card, you list out all of your Mach numbers and then all of your reduced frequencies. If you use an MK Aero 2 card, you list your Mach number and reduced frequencies in pairs. Okay, so I think uh, FEMAP just does this probably for robustness, although I'm not, I, I can't really speak to why they make, made that decision. Um, but they're, they're equivalent. It's just how you want to write the cards is really all that matters. Okay, your next question is, could these methods be applicable for structures like buildings or bridges? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I don't see why not. Um, so uh, I didn't bring this up because it's always mentioned, uh, but there's that famous uh, Tacoma and Arrows Bridge example. This would be perfect for modeling a structure like that. Um, in that case, it was, a, it was a bridge that exhibited flutter um, and actually ended up taking it all the way to failure. Um, again, with a, with a building, I think that'd be a little bit less conventional, but you know, you can m model slender bodies and stuff like that. Um, you might have to go ahead and modify your pressures uh, with something a little bit more than a potential flow method, because when you're talking about buildings, depending on the, the way it's aligned, right, um, your viscous effects may no longer be negligible, right? You might have some separation of flow and stuff like that. But, but yeah, again, as a, as a simple, rough answer, I don't see why you couldn't do that. Okay, and the final question I see is, can you go over what you did for the span and area in static air elasticity and why you did that? Absolutely, that's a great question. Okay, so the reason why is going to be a little bit unsatisfying. Okay, let me, um, let's see, I'm going to back out of this. I'm going to just go to that Excel uh, sheet that I have. For whatever reason, when you're using symmetry in a model within NASTRAN, uh, the numbers that it takes in 
is that it needs to consider double the span, right? So if we were talking about the, air, the performance of an aircraft, okay, when we talk about that Oswald efficiency factor, right, that's always when you go from tip to tip of the, of, of the aircraft wing, right? Um, that's not when you go from tip to root, right? And so this is trying to, it's, again, I can't speak to why that was done, uh, but that's just a convention that's taken, and it likely has something to do with the fact that you're trying to be consistent with how stuff was either normalized or, or that efficiency thing, right? So all you have to do is, if you're using, uh, if you're running your elastic analysis on a model with symmetry, okay, and you have to reference the span, which I think it only came up in the static or elastic example, use double the span. You can see here's, here's the actual span that I have in the model, right, and I just doubled it. Um, now, when you're calculating the area, you actually want just a physical area that's in the model, because when you're redimensionalizing those air elastic parameters, your air elastic influence coefficients, you need to redimensionalize it by your actual uh, area of your aerodynamic model. So you can see I did the core times the span, right, that double span that I have, and then I just divided it by two. Um, you know, it's, it's something hopefully you learn once and you just keep it in the back of your mind. It's really nothing fancy. If we were doing a full aircraft, you wouldn't have to worry about that, right? But since we were considering symmetry, that's really when that comes into play. Um, again, I know it can be tricky, but, um, but that's just for whatever reason. That's a convention that NASTRAN ended up going with. All right, Ben, that's all the questions. Um, if anybody else has any more questions, feel free to email Ben or myself. This is Jim Jeans. Um, and uh, we will uh, post a recording of this uh, to go to webinar probably tomorrow if we can get it done that fast. Thanks for coming, and we'll talk to you all later.